So you'll remember last week, Pastor Kenny started a series on the pastorals, and um, we focused on Timothy. This week, we're going to focus on Paul, the author, the earthly author of the letter to Timothy, and the rest of the pastorals. And I'm going to be reading out of three passages, two out of Acts, and then one out of Philippians. I'm going to be starting in Acts 21, verses 27 through 40. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and lay hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was provoked, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once, he took along some soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up and took hold of him and ordered him to be bound with two chains, and he began asking him, who he was and what he had done. But among the crowd, some were shouting one thing and some another. And when he could not find out the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he got to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people kept following them, shouting away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, motioned to the people with his hand. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect. We're going to skip what he said, focusing on Paul himself. We're going to Acts 22, verses 22 through 30. They listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging, so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. But when they stretched him out, With thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do, for this man is a Roman? The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, Those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him, and the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman, and because he had put him in chains. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble, and brought Paul down and set him before them. Now we're flipping to Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we just ask that you prepare us for this sermon. Lord, just help us to understand the truths that you're about to unfold before us, illumine our minds and soften our hearts to accept them. And Lord, I 
as we think on, on Paul and, and the picture painted of him and the picture he paints of himself, Lord, do we just, we see as he's born in, into a, a life of, of affluence that it is of your hand, Lord, and for your work and for your glory. And then later, likewise, as, as he's beaten and persecuted and suffers, it's also for your work and for your glory, Lord. And as we look upon our own lives, let us accept that which you bless us with, you bless us through, whether it be materially, that we use it to your work and to your glory, and likewise, that our, our challenges and our suffering, that we accept that we are your children regardless of our physical state, and that we use them towards your work and towards your glory, Lord. It's in the name of your Son that we pray. Amen. All right. Who is Paul? Early life and times. So I skipped over the part that uh, in chapter 22 where he gives his account, his life, because we'll be taking up with that subject matter next week. And we're transitioning from the recipient of the letter to the human author of these divinely inspired pastoral epistles. Without question, the most important man who ever lived is Jesus Christ. Without question. And from one to two, from first place to second place, is like from the Milky Way galaxy to the galaxy that's furthest away in the universe. I mean, there's, there's no comparison between number one, the, the first most important person who ever lived, and the second most important person who ever lived. But I would say that I think Paul would be, especially in Christianity and maybe even world history, the next most important person who ever lived. Without Paul, Christianity would not have spread westward. I mean, we, I know it was a possibility other ways, but this is the way that God did it, okay? We're just talking about what God actually did. Uh, you have much of the New Testament that you receive through the hand of Paul and not only that, but his influence, I think his influence on the writer of Hebrews as well, if the writer of Hebrews happened to be Apollos. So all of these things combined, I think, state the case or make the case for Paul being the second most important person, especially Christianity, in the history of the world. We've read two passages this morning about Paul. And that's the way I would put it. They're about Paul. You have a, a witness uh, who is telling you what he sees and what he hears. You might compare him to a painter who is painting a picture. He, he watches Paul and he paints the picture. And again, and I'll, I'll say this to you, if you haven't seen the, the latest uh, uh, movie about Paul, The Apostle Paul, it has Jim Caviezel in it. I would strongly recommend you watch that movie. It's a very good movie. Uh, the second thing that we see here then in the book of Philippians, though, is we see the autobiographical Paul. We see Paul looking in the mirror and painting a picture of himself, the self-portrait. So we have the portrait that is painted by Luke and the portrait that is painted by Paul himself as we see the result of these two paintings in these passages that we look at today are a composite life of the early or early life of Paul. Now, here is a theme of this sermon. Sometimes in life and sometimes in history, things happen that you think are bad. In, in my younger years, I was a very selfish man, very arrogant man. And I did and said things that I wish I had not done. And I know that perhaps you too in your life have done some things that you wish you hadn't done or said some things that you wish you hadn't said or had things that happened to you that you wish had not happened. And yet they did. And as you mature and grow and as you see things work out, you realize that God works these things for good. Now, that's not to say that what you do that God works out for good is, is it good that you did it because certainly we do things that are evil and do things that are bad that, that we should not do. 
But I'm just saying in, in the cosmos of a big G God, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Everything is working according to the plan of God. Now when I look at Paul, and I see this man who is used of God not only to write scripture, I mean authoritative scripture. Let that sink in. He is writing authoritative scripture. And what is written about him in Acts is authoritative scripture, and it's there for a reason. You know, Paul is not God. Paul is not Jesus. And yet here we have biographical information about Paul. Why? Well, it has to serve a purpose. You know, as Eric was reading that this morning, especially in the first service, I was thinking about almost every phrase Every phrase of what he's reading is so right with meaning and filled with meaning about God's revelation, about what God is doing. And I'm just, I'm just hitting a real bird's eye view of that this morning in this early life of Paul. But so much that's said there, you could unpack that and just unpack and look at theology itself. But what I want us to do is I want us to look at this man who, who went from Jerusalem to Antioch, from Antioch to Cyprus to Asia Minor, we talked about this last week, and then did it again, and then did it again, and went further to Greece, and then on the fourth trip he was actually taken to Rome where he was in prison, and perhaps, as we'll see next week, he was released from prison and went as far as Spain. This man who carried the gospel and who carried it with this, such confidence that he could leave churches behind that had been established so that he might go further and continue to carry the word to other places. This man, I want you to understand the, the providence of God and how God brings so many things together. Think pieces of a puzzle that you would never have thought about in order for this ministry to take place. Things that you would say, things that the Jews would say, these are bad things. Well, it shows you what they know. So we're going to unpack these three passages that Eric read in front of us this morning as we look at this composite of Paul's early life and we see the providence of God working to bring Paul to where he was. So the first thing we want to look at this morning is the Jews under the Romans. We see this in verses 27 through 30, 36. We see here that Paul is in the middle of an uproar and the people get all upset and they want to do away with Paul. They want to stone Paul. Uh, this is beginning at verse 27. And then as the city is in an uproar, and you know the Romans do not like, do not like an uproar, the people rush together. The Roman commander heard about it. There was a report to him that Jerusalem was in confusion. And so he took some soldiers and the centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the command of the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So they're already beating him. Okay? And the next step is stoning. The Romans had rules, and in their rules, you could not, the, the, the governments there were not to take capital offenses into their own hands except in religious cases. And there were exceptions for this, and they were about to take the exception. But immediately, we see here that the Romans, when they get there, they take Paul out of the hands of the mob, they, bind, they, they bound him with chains and they begin to question him as the crowd shouts over them. And because of this, the commander decides to take Paul back to his headquarters. Now suppose the Romans had not been there. Just suppose Paul would have been killed. 
I'll go you one better. Had the Romans not been in Palestine when they were, Jesus would have been stoned and not nailed to a cross. And then Deuteronomy would not have been fulfilled, would it were, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. So how did all this happen? Paul would never have gone to the capital of the world except for his Roman citizenship. Think about this. How did it happen? Well, go back 500 years. And Judah finally falls to the Babylonians. And the best of the Jews are taken off into exile. The rest are left. The 100 years before that, the Assyrians had had intermingled the northern tribes with other countries, other ethnicities. And so when they leave, there's this vacuum. And I know that when you read the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra, you see the exiles coming back. But what you need to understand is that at the end of the 70 years, Jerusalem and Judah are really never, ever autonomous again, except for one snippet of time. At first, they're a satrap of the Persian Empire. So they're under Cyrus. And then when Alexander the Great defeats Persia, and he goes east and he eventually dies, his empire is split between his generals and essentially or or ultimately the Seleucids to the north and the Ptolemies to the south. They divide the empire, and Israel is right between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And because of that, they seek to impose rule there. And Antiochus Epiphanes desecrates the temple. And because of this, there is a revolt in Jerusalem led by Judas Maccabees and the Maccabee boys. And for a brief time, they, through guerrilla warfare and other areas, they defeat the Seleucids. And... Eventually, the Hasmoneans, the most powerful was John Hyrcanus. They ruled for a short time, but John wanted power, and so he incorporates into his position both priest and king. And the Assyrians could not stand this. Eventually, he relinquished the priestly role and gave it to the house of Zadok the priestly house, but because of their internecine conflicts and quarrels, eventually one faction asked the Romans who have risen to power then, this is in around 63 BC when Pompey was in power, they asked the Romans to come in and to help them decide the issue. That's like mice you know, quarreling over cheese, inviting the cat in to help them decide who who should get the cheese. So the Romans occupied Palestine, end of independence. So the Roman rule is established there. The Hasmonean rule is abolished. The priesthood of Zadok, though, is allowed to remain and to conduct worship at the temple. And this will be the pattern until 70 A.D. But think about that. Were it not for the Romans, not only would Paul not have been saved that day, but the, the peace, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, the, the roads and the, the travel, the, the safety on the seas as far as piracy and all of that, was all products of Roman dominance. And under this dominance, Paul ministers and Paul travels and does all that he does. And people would have said, well, the Romans are evil. And yes, they were. We see that in the book of Revelation. They are evil. But God is in control. And so God, even under this evil empire, God is working things for good. God is working things for the spread of his gospel. 
and for the writing of these letters that we now have in our Bibles. Wow. The second thing that we learn about Paul in this passage in chapter 21 is that Paul is a citizen of no insignificant city. He says when the commander says to him, he says, uh, do you speak Greek? And Paul says, yes. He says, well, then you're not the Egyptian that tried to uh, stir up a revolt and led 4,000, this is in verse 38, led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. The King James says, no mean city. I like that. Tarsus is a province of Syria, Cilicia. This is where Paul spent three years after his conversion. We see that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 21. Let me tell you some things about Tarsus that will help you know about Paul. Tarsus is an economic hub because of its place on the, the Sindhu River. Uh, it's at the, at the mouth. Today it's about 12 miles inland. It's still called Tarsus. Legend has it that Belafon who rode uh, Pegasus, the winged horse, that he, he, for whatever reason, kind of crash-landed at this place, and he injured his foot. And so it became the city of the sore foot. If you look up Tarsus in your dictionary, the first thing you're going to see is that Tarsus is a group of bones in your foot. So Tarsus literally meant sore foot. That's just one legend. But also, it's the place where Antony and Cleopatra had one of the most celebrated meetings, where she comes up the river on the barge. Shakespeare captures this in his work on Antony and Cleopatra, Act 2, scene to his play, Antony and Cleopatra. And it says, I'll just read you the scene 2, from the barge a strange invisible perfume hits the scene on the, of, the adjacent, of the adjacent wharfs. The city cast her people out upon her, and Antony, enthroned in the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which but for a vacancy had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. <laughs> You're a pretty, pretty beautiful woman when the air itself comes to see you and leaves a vacuum in nature. <laughs> or else you're quite the poet. <laughs> Two notable figures, Athena Doris and Nestor the Academician. You see, Tarsus is not only a city known for economics. It was a city of wealth, a city of historical importance. But it's also one of the leading educational cities in the world. It stood with the big three. There was Tarsus, Alexandria, and Athens. Athenodorus, one of the leaders in the city who would leave for Rome in the, 40, in the, in the fourth decade before Christ is born, he went to Rome to be a tutor of a very famous student. His student was Octavian. You know him as Caesar Augustus. Athenodorus was his personal tutor. You ever heard the saying, uh, before you say anything, after you get mad, count to ten? <laughs> you ever heard that? Athenodorus told and rebuked Octavian. He said, Octavian, before you say anything brash, when somebody says something that makes you angry, before you say anything, he said, recite the alphabet. And then you say something. He went back and wrote the Constitution for Tarsus. Tarsus had one of the largest libraries in the world. 200,000 books on biology alone. To have a degree from its university, it had its own university, to have a degree from there was, was one of the top degrees in all the world. So it's an education center. And this is where Paul is born. Now think about this. Paul is a man of letters. It's obvious 
and it's obvious to this Roman commander, he says, you speak Greek. Well, yes. And then he turns right around and speaks Hebrew, which is the official language of the Jewish religion. It's not the common language. In the synagogues, they spoke not Hebrew, but Aramaic. So Paul commands three languages, probably more, because he travels all over the world. You know what, you know what the other nations call people that can speak only one language, don't you? Americans. <laughs> Paul is a man who is very educated, very erudite. Paul comes from a prominent family. Now, a Jewish family living in Tarsus, who for whatever reason, this brings us to the next thing in Acts 22, verses 22 through 30, Paul says he is a Roman citizen. So he's born in Tarsus in the first decade of the Christian era, born sometime along the time Christ is born. He's born in a favored city, but also to parents who are Roman citizens. Now, how did they get their citizenship? Did they do a favor for the Romans? Was there some heroic act? We don't know. But here Paul is in this wealthy city with Jewish parents who are also Roman citizens. Paul is a man who is born in a family of means. He has the greatest education available to him. And the means to get it. And then he travels the world with the protection of his Roman citizenship. This is only, the only time that he ever uses it. Now, the Roman officer says to Paul, he says, so you're a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes. And the Roman commander says, he says, well, I bought mine. Uh, you see this in verse 28 of chapter 22. I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. It was worth a lot to be a Roman citizen. And if you purchase citizenship, and there were laws that codified this and uh, 84 and 89, there was, your name was written in a registry of the town in which you earned your citizenship, and you were given documents that you could carry with you, have in your home that stated your Roman citizenship. You know, for Paul just to say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, <laughs> it's almost like going to court and saying, hey, I'm innocent. <laughs> well, everybody's innocent. But the difference is, to say you're innocent is not a capital offense even if you're guilty. But to say you're a Roman citizen and you're not a Roman citizen, that is a capital offense. If you say you're a Roman citizen, you better be able to prove it. So there was the documentation of buying the citizenship, and there was also then those who were born Romans. Every Roman had three names, a forename called the Praeonimum, the family name, which was the Nomen, and the additional name, the Cogaman. We only know Paul's Cogaman name, his, his additional name, and his name. Let me ask you this. So why is Paul called Paul? So he's Saul to the Jews, right? Why does everybody in the, in the Greek world call him Paul? You think it's some kind of uh, transliteration of Saul? No. This is, this is his Roman name. His Roman name is Paulus. So he's called Paul. So his citizenship will ultimately land him before Caesar himself. Citizens who were born were given, their names were, all, were also put on birth registrations in those cities. And then they were giving this, this birth certificate, kind of like what we get now, and it had four folding flaps that folded over it. And so they didn't have computers, but they could write letters. And they could find out, if you claimed you were a Roman citizen, there were ways of finding out whether it were true or whether it was false. And it was a terrible thing to say. It was true if it were not. And then finally, we look at Paul's thoughts on his early life as he tells the Philippians, as he warns them against the, the Judaizers, the false circumcision. He says, 
to what was probably the most important aspect of his birth for him. For him, it wasn't, I'm a Roman citizen. That was important. To him, it wasn't, I was born to a a well-to-do family in Tarsus, a, a famous city for education and economics and culture. But for him, the most advantageous thing, the most valuable part of his early life is that he is a Hebrew of Hebrews. You see, because of the diaspora, because the, the Jews had been spread all over the world, they worshipped in different synagogues. Some worshipped in the Greek-speaking synagogues. They're called Hellenists. You see them in Acts. Others worshipped in Hebrew synagogues, and they, they consider themselves the first-class citizens. They worshipped in Aramaic and read the Bible in Hebrew. Paul says, I was of that group. I was the first class group. I knew my tribal ancestry. Maybe his name was Saul because he was of the same tribe of the first king of Israel. But not only was he a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was a Pharisee. Now, when you and I say that, you know, there's kind of this natural kind of reaction. Pharisee. <laughs> we use Pharisee pejoratively. We use it to put things down. It wasn't used that way in Paul's day. You see, the, Par- the Pharisees came from the Hasidians, and I told you a while ago about the objections to John Hyrcanus being priest and king, it was this group that objected. They were known as the purest of the law. They wrote commentaries on the law, the mission of the Talmud, and they created the oral tradition, which was put right up there with Scripture. They were opposed to the Sadducees who believed only the law and rejected all spiritualism and all commentaries. The Pharisees had two major schools in time, Hillel and Shammai. Hillel was famous for this saying, and listen to this and tell me if you've heard something like this before. He said, what is hateful to yourself, do not do to another. That is the whole law. All the rest is commentary. Now, what does that sound like? Sound familiar to you? Sounds like something like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It says the same thing, only one says it negatively and one says it positively. Hillel was a Pharisee who believed that the law was certainly everything, but that we should, or that people should kind of, you know, have a little latitude in interpreting the law. His, one of the famous people in that school was a man by the name of Gamaliel. And we see him in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles are brought on trial. And in verse 33, he speaks, and he is of the the, the, the Hillel school, and verses 33 through 37, he gives an example of some men who rose up claiming to be who they were not, and eventually they were killed, and they were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Uh, but then he says this, in the present case, that is the case of the apostles before them, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. So you can see the latitude that he gives. Okay, we're going to let God decide this. And in that case, the men listened. And then there was the other school. It was the school of Shema, the Shamanites. They regarded the breadth of one law to be the breadth of all law. In other words, again, if you break one 
you've broken them all. Paul says that, doesn't he? And even though Paul says he's a student of Gamaliel, he sounds a lot more like a student of Shammah. Especially when he persecutes the church. He doesn't wait to see if it's going to stand, if it's of God or not. He takes matters into his own hands and actively persecutes the church, as we'll see next week. Shema said, the person is to obey the Holy One. It is not to reason why. So even though Paul is a student of Gamaliel, again, he seems to adopt the shamanite version of interpreting the law. So all of this, that he's in the Roman Empire, that he's from Tarsus, that he's a Roman citizen, and that he is a Pharisee. Even the kind of Pharisee that he is. All of this goes into who Paul is. When God saves you, he changes your heart. He doesn't change your past. Doesn't change what you've learned. Doesn't change where you went to school. Doesn't change your profession most times or sometimes. Most times not. Doesn't change past mistakes. Changes your heart. And all of those things, when you take them in their sum, they contribute to who you are. Things you've learned things that you can build on, things that you need to get rid of. But they're there. Paul was no different. So when Paul writes, when Paul thinks, his education is a part of that. When Paul talks about the Pharisees, Paul knows the Pharisees. Paul knows what it's like to be a Pharisee. And when he says to the Roman governor in Judea, I appeal to Caesar, all of that goes back to who Paul is and to his context. So, here's the question. I hope you've liked history this morning. I've enjoyed telling you all of this. Hope you've enjoyed hearing it. But at the end of the day, two questions. Why is it important? Why does it matter? Right? Does it matter? Just because he wrote Scripture, does it matter? Just because understanding him helps us understand Scripture, does it matter? Is it important? I think I probably built the answer into my questions. From the school of thought, the, the three schools that emerged from the Maccabean revolt in those times, and this is, we have a booklet on this at the intertestamental period if you'd like this, just ask Linda for it. There were three, three major schools, the Essenes, which were strict predestinarians, the Sadducees, which were strict free will, and the Pharisees, which were a combination of both. Here, I think, is what the Bible teaches. There is a divine plan, that is God's plan, big G God, that cannot be changed. It cannot be changed. It's not like the sci-fi programs that we watch, you know, where people go back in time or go forward in time and they change things and things happen differently. That's not going to happen. Not to God's plan. God's plan is going to work out. If it doesn't, then revelation isn't true, is it? It's going to work out. But this is, this is the, the part that just makes your mind want to explode. 
God works his plan out through secondary causes and secondary means, and he uses human agency, human choices, human decisions, human actions, even human thoughts. And all of these things, God works out in the plan so that everything works together in accomplishing his plan. So at the end of the day, when you see Paul, when you see Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church, and you think, that's a bad thing, God is using that. When you see what Peter says are wicked men doing a wicked thing, God uses that for the ultimate good of the cosmos. That's who God is. That's who God is. And in my life and in your life, oh, we want to make the right decisions and we want to do the right things, and certainly we do, and we want to be, we want to be in God's, you know, we want to be being sanctified and we are already set apart and we already have a purpose and God is working everything out and we want to be in step with that. We don't want to be in tension with God and yet, beloved, God is working things out and you will not be left behind. You will not be left behind. Is that comforting for you? It is for me. It is for me. The second thing that I want to talk to you about just at the end God does not give divine revelation. When you look at this for 400 years, much of the period that I have talked to you this morning about, God did not give special revelation. There was not a book between Malachi and Galatians. Galatians is one of the earliest books of the New Testament. Hebrews is probably another very early book. Not a thing. As far as written revelation. But oh, what God is doing in His revelation. Oh, what God is doing in His plans. And we've seen that this morning, that God is using people. God is using places. God is using empires. He uses people. He blends all of these things with the natural predispositions of people to develop us into the instruments that we become, holy instruments working out in us that we might truly worship Him. Craig, I'm going to leave you with this statement. In the New Testament, this is by F.F. F. Bruce, in the New Testament, religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. Religion is grace. Ethics is gratitude. You see, I look at my life, and I look at your life, and I look at the way God gave me the Scriptures, and gave all of us, gave His church the Scriptures. I look at how He gave us Christ. I look at all that God has done, and you know what I see? I see the grace of God everywhere. Everywhere I see the grace of God poured out in the midst of an evil world, in the midst of a world where people are in open rebellion against God. I see God gracing people, some people special grace to salvation, other people common grace for, for good things. And what is my response to that? My response is worship, and with worship comes good works. Good works. Because how could I, how could I do evil when grace superabounds? God forbid. Let's stand for prayer. Oh Lord, our minds need to be expanded. We need to 
try to understand what a great big God you are. And we, when we look at this book that you've given to us to reveal to us who you are, to reveal to us Jesus Christ, to reveal to us this great plan of salvation, this great plan of redemption, we need to understand, Lord, the lengths, Lord, the billions of, of circumstances that you've worked through to create this Bible, to create this authoritative word. Lord, even to move empires, even to set up cultural center, centers in certain cities and for a, a child to be born in that city. Lord, for there to be a revolt and emerge from that a sect of people called Pharisees. Lord, so many amazing and wondrous things you've done to bring us the Bible. And oh, how our hearts and our minds should rejoice that you would bow low to speak to us, to communicate to us. Lord, just, just little insignificant creatures bound in our rebellion, and yet you come to us and you draw us with your love. And you show us the great links you've gone to. Lord, we were talking about this morning about Paul and the Bible. Last year we were talking about what you did in the Old Testament to bring Jesus to us. All of these things you've done, you've accomplished. And, and you've used human beings. And human agency. It is astounding that you know these things, that you've planned these things, and that these things are working together for the good of those who love you and who are called for your purposes. Oh God, how much more does Romans 8, 28 mean to us as believers when we see what you've done? When we see and when we grasp what you can do, oh, our minds just expand to try to gain any insight. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us, we pray, to see this more clearly, that we might worship you, oh, with more passion. I pray for those this morning who are here who do not know you, who do not know this this word is authoritative. Oh, how I pray, Holy Spirit, that you might open their hearts and their minds, that they might come to you and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Oh, Lord, that you would show them what you've done. Oh, the magnificent, marvelous things you've done, the costly things you've done, that they might be saved. Oh, how I pray, even today, Holy Spirit, that you would change their hearts and minds and bring them to Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you've been listening, and you're here this morning, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you've never followed Him, you've never followed Him in baptism, I'd love to talk to you this morning after the service and tell you how you can know Christ by believing in Him, by trusting in Him, that you can know Him. And this, this oh, beloved, isn't this a marvelous, marvelous revelation? Oh, my goodness. And I just wanted you to see this morning and next week the links that God has gone to to bring this book, this revelation, this truth that we might know and that we might know Him. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Hope to see you tonight for the panel.